Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Popverse. This is a virtual space created by Read Pop, and this video is sponsored by thepopverse.com, celebrating the best in movies, TVs, and comics. And today we have two amazing guests joining with us to chat. Love everlasting. Please welcome along with me, Mr. Tom King and Miss Elsa Chartier. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you. This, you rock for having us. It means a ton. Read Pop was so nice to me in the beginning of my career. Um, I can't tell you. That, and uh, then they weren't. And then, yeah, now ever <laughs> since then, they just, every time I see Mike, he slaps you in the face. It's terrible. Um, you said New York Avogad? I think not. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Your, the doors are closed to you. It's, it's yeah. So, this is the last time you see me in New York, I'll be in the gutters. <laughs> The last time you'll ever be appearing here, never again. <laughs> All right, let's start like super easy. I'm sure you've told these stories a million times, but for both of you, what are your origin stories? How did you come to be a part of Love Everlasting? Tom, you want to go? <laughs> what, what, my origin story is like, how did I get from being a normal person to a comic book writer or just, or just this one comic book? Just this comic. How did it spring forth from your brain like Athena jumping from Zeus's brow? Sure. Um, that's exactly how it happened. I just sat down and suddenly it, per uh, no. Um, so uh, uh, I, 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 like a lot of nerds during the pandemic was collecting comic book art as just as a way to get something delivered to my house and change one week <laughs> from another. And I was looking to buy sort of big pages, Kirby Toth pages, and I couldn't meet superhero pages from those guys or, you know, anywhere from $20,000 to hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so um, I noticed that the romance pages were, were more, more affordable, more like, I mean, they were still very expensive, but I could buy them. And so I started buying these sort of romance pages, which are you know, these gorgeous pages by the best artists in comics, Matt Baker, you know, um, Alex Toth, Kirby, um, Bob Oxner. And, uh, and of course, you got curious about where these pages came from. And they, so I started to buy the romance comics, just so I had the pages, the books to match the art. And I started reading these romance comics that I had sitting around. And they were just, it was like discovering a new world that I didn't know existed. It was, there are very few things in comics that I thought I didn't know about, just having been, you know, in it since I was, you know, seven years old. And so to discover that, that, for 30 years, a quarter of comics were in a genre that I'd never read before, that there were literally mm -hmm. 10,000 comics that I had never opened or even seen reprinted. Um, and, and to be like, wow, this, is, this was a huge part of our industry for lo lo so long. Like Stan Lee wrote more romance comics than he did superhero comics. It's a bizarre, just a fact. And so that I, um, I started reading them and, and, I, I, and at the same time, what should I tell? Elsa had reached out to me saying, do you want to do creator own? And so I needed an idea and sort of the combination of Elsa plus having read these bizarre comics came into being with that love everlasting. Yeah, pretty much. I think you getting into romance comics and me uh, asking you if you wanted to do like a creator own was just like the planets aligned at the right moment. Um, yes. But yeah, in terms of why I reached out to Tom, so I had finished working on November, which was my previous um, creator on comic that I had done. It's a series of graphic novels that I did with Matt Fraction. And I wanted something, something um, that was different. I wanted something that would come out in comic shops because November came out as individual graphic novels, so not mm -hmm. monthly uh, comics. So I wanted that. I also wanted to work with a really, really good writer. And <laughs> my tastes are very, you know, limited i like a certain kind of writers and so tom was well, one, nice of you got one of the two so that's pretty good that's that's not bad, that's bad. <laughs> and uh i knew i loved uh tom's work and i also knew that he hadn't done like your creator own before so a part of me was like why hasn't it done one maybe he's not interested and the other one maybe more um business oriented was like if i if i if my next create own could be with Tom's first create own books, that would be really nice. Just in terms of, you know, marketing. You have to think about that when you're an indie creator. But that was part of um, the decision making process and me reaching out to Tom. And of course, you know, the scripts has, have been like even better than I um, could have ever dreamt. It's interesting that you bring up the scripts because the scripts are part of the 
experience that you get if you support the comic and the project on Substack. And I wanted to ask about that. I know we're here because it's coming out in print and it's coming out to a completely different audience, but Love Everlasting found its legs as a Substack book. So maybe this is a question for Tom, but Elsa, I would love for you to jump in. Why was Substack the right place to tell this story? I mean, it's it's, it's more of a coincidence than anything. Uh, Elsa and I had already sort of been in the preparation of making this as a physical comic uh, from day one when Substack approached uh, approached us uh, with the possibility of doing a digital comic. And um, when someone offers you a ton of no strings money to make a comic, you just say yes. <laughs> uh, because that I mean, never happens. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's, not, it's no. not something that has happened in the 80 year <laughs> history of our industry when someone's like, here's a bunch of money, make a comic. You owe us nothing. Like that's not a thing. Um, <laughs> And it happened, it, this, this window opened. Um, and so uh, we said yes. And, and it, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it's a very nice platform for putting out stuff and for, for you know, doing blogs and showing people behind the scenes. And, and uh, I, I've been enjoying it much more than I thought I would. But, but mainly for me, it, was, it, 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 it gave us the possibility to make this an incredibly high quality comic to, to, to do with the best art, the best lettering, um, uh, and, and to take sort of that risk out way up front and, and to give people for my first creator own a comic that looks um, and feels as good as anything you'd get from the big two. I, I think it allowed us to, like you said, not to have to rush to print. Mm -hmm. uh, because when you have to like finance and fund an entire, like we're at issue eight right now when, uh, when Love Everlasting One is coming out at Image, I will be working on issue eight. So that means eight issues that you have to have colored, to have lettered. I, I have to, um, you know, live. <laughs> so <laughs> <What>? that, allo <laughs> right, that allowed us not to have to rush to print too fast and take our time. Yeah, so I had tried like in, in my early days, sorry, to, 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 um, to do creator own and had given up after one issue twice after paying whatever. Because this is early in my career, but once you pay that first 5,000 and you get nothing back and you're like, oh, it's, it's it goes very quickly um, to the upfront money. Yeah, it's a long-term planning working in creator-owned comics. So besides the autonomy that you get in terms of like scheduling and finances, you're both known more for traditional print comics. Is there anything different in your processes now working for a digital first story? Not really. Not in terms of the comic <laughs> itself. In terms of like taking taking notes while I'm working on the book to have just things to talk about in the blog posts, yeah. But in terms of <laughs> producing the comic, no. Yeah, I no, it's it's kind of I remember the like the original days of like Thrill Bent when they were doing sort of all this um, yeah. digital comics, like experimentation where they're gonna do everything, you know, widescreen and sound effects and like make it like an exp I don't know that I, I, I think comics don't need all that like bells and whistles. I think a, a comic is a comic is a comic, whether you read it on, I mean, I, I read most of my comics on iPad Pro, which is just as big as a comic. And I, 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 I love that. Um, but I also, I, I also buy everything in, in trades if I really want to sort of get lost in a thing. Um, so no, no, I, I, I treat this exactly as I do any print comic. There's, there's zero difference. And now you are entering, you're re-entering into the world of print comics. Is it a little bit like throwing your mind back, talking and promoting issue one again while you're working on issue eight, nine, ten? Yeah, uh, it's the the grind is very real right now <laughs> uh, because it's it's one one FOC after an FOC after an FOC. <laughs> so, so it's like it's a lot of additional work, you know, and, and on top of working on the comic itself. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you would know about this better than I would actually, but, but, but I mean, I've, I've been stuck at big two comics for almost a decade now, and it's mm. so much easier than creator own comics. I have, <laughs> utter, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's a bunch easier having a, a, a big company behind you that does all the thousands of details you don't realize that your editor and your production managers and all that people are doing um, that we, and by we, mostly it's Elsa, but really, because she's handling, she's incredibly organized and, and doing incredible work on all of this stuff. Um, it's it's just yeah it's a lot more work to do a creator own than than a, than a big two comic because you you're you're responsible for so much more of, of, of that um, work. And we ended okay. up like needed help anyway. It's not something. It's something that you can do alone, 
but it's really, really hard. Or when I say alone, like the two creators, it's it's really tough. So now we have Marla with us. That's helped like tremendously. It's really tough producing a monthly comic, uh, marketing it, doing podcasts, uh, doing, you know, <laughs> handling the production and just being on time every month for an ongoing series, especially. That's almost impossible to do if you want to stay sane and have a semblance yeah. of a life. <laughs> A life, what is that? We don't know right. her. Okay, we've talked business, big picture. I want to ask you some specific questions. We won't go too spoilery because we are here to promote issue one. But can we talk a little bit about Joan, please? Because I love her so much. And Tom, you revealed that you'd been like knee deep reading romance comics. Does she take inspiration <laughs> from specific heroines or archetypes or maybe women in your life? Yes, I mean, Joan is a complicated character in that she starts out as not a character and she becomes one as we go along in this book. Um, the idea behind this this comic was, again, I was, I was reading all these um, 50s, 60s, 70s romance comics, and, and basically they're the same format. There's usually three, com three little, they're anthology series, uh, three stories per, um, and the, the tale is the same. There's some sort of obstacle as, a, as a, a female protagonist, some sort of obstacle she has to overcome to fall in love with her generic bo boyfriend. Um, and it, it could be like, <laughs> like her sister's also in love with her, or he's rich and she's poor, or she's rich and he's poor, or there's just some like little thing and they have eight pages to overcome. And at the end they kiss and they say they're going to marry each other. And then you turn the page and it's a new thing and they start over. And I was just kind of reading these things over and over. And it seemed to me just because it was this sort of same generic, boring woman, because it was, these was comics were, mostly written by um, old dudes. Like, so they were just kept creating the same sort of generic, boring, ideal 50s, you know, 25 year old woman. And, uh, and I was like, what a strange life she's living where every time she kisses someone, she wakes up in a new scenario or a new timeline. Sometimes she'd be in the past, sometimes in the future, sometimes in the present. And I was like, who is this? Who is this woman who has to live all these lives? And what happens when she realizes that she's doing this? And, and I was like, oh, that's a story. That's, that's something like this, this sort of ideal 50s um, Donna Reed S woman realizes that every time she falls in love, she disappears into another story. And maybe she doesn't want to do that anymore. Maybe she wants to find out what life really is. And I was like, and that, that's where we start. And that's where we first meet Joan, where, where her character at the very beginning of this is something that's sort of given to her, that's designed for her, that's purposely generic. And she has to discover who she is as a human and as a woman. And she's awesome. She is so awesome. And you plant a lot of seeds for her and for where the reveals come later in the story and where maybe the story engine comes from. How challenging is that for both of you making sure that, okay, in issue one, we're going to make sure we see this, this, and this. And she says this, this, and this to pay off when she meets this character in issue five. Like, what are some unique challenges around that? I, I, so at, during the pandemic, um, which is now what, three years? Oh my God, it's been a long time, right? Uh, this never ending thing. But I, I changed how I wrote comics where before, like when I was writing Batman's double ship, I'd write issue seven and then issue 20 and then issue 13. And then I'd write an issue of Mr. Miracle. N now I write all my comics at once, like a novel. So I'll, I'll mm -hmm. write five at, five Love Everlastings at a time and then another five. So. Oh. By doing that, I can I know exactly what's in issue five before even Elsa starts drawing issue one. So I can go back and sort of um, and, and, and make it all make sense and, and make it more like a novel where it's a, it's a bigger structure. So that makes it easy. I mean, I think the biggest challenge in this book is to not make it Gilligan's Island um, mm -hmm. and to not make it lost <laughs> where it's like or uh, or, or uh, a Star Trek Voyager would be a good example for a super nerd like you um, <laughs> w w where where where. Uh, I think Voyager fans got bored with, are they going to get out of the Delta Quadrant? Like, all right, that, that's a dumb timeline. Like it has to be about exploring, not about sort of whether they're going to get home every, because they're never going to get home. They're going to get home in, in season seven. Um, mm -hmm. so, so that that's the big challenge. So it'd be like, yes, there's a mystery here. She's trapped in these comics. Why is she trapped? But the comic isn't about getting off the island. It's about exploring the island and exploring who she is. So that'll make it good for anyone who was frustrated by Lost. <laughs> yes. And it also helps that I've made a rule like before this starts, I'm going to have an ending. So I know what it's, I know what the whole, I know what the <laughs> ending is. I know what this is. I know what the trap is. It's not like Lost where we have to sort of make it up in season five and hope it flies. Somewhere somebody's already angry tweeting at us and we're just recording this live right now. 
Loss is uh, amazing, but there was some improvisation. Yeah. <laughs> but also uh, one thing that's that's great about just one second about love everlasting is that it's not really about the, its concept like it's not mm -hmm. centered that much around the concept there are many m more interesting things to say about just the story and the storyline that she's mm -hmm. in that goes beyond the con the core concept which was maybe where, where last kind of went off rail <laughs> <laughs> if i <laughs> may say so. dragging lost <laughs> Uh, Elsa, I wanted to ask you, and I know this could be spoilery, so you can play it close to the vest if you want. Um, as an artist, what were some of your favorite uh, time periods or costume drama periods that you got to tackle when you were working on, or as you've been working on Love Everlasting? Oh, gosh. Um, I think, I think it was the Victorian um, um, piece that we did, like, uh, just the design of the of the of the bow in that issue with the with the hair like that i had so much fun with everything victorian <laughs> because that was very that was very exotic you know 50s 60s 70s we're kind of used to that design being repurposed in our you know current modern era whereas victorian is not as not as used so yeah that was really fun and i want to compliment you particularly on Joan's boyfriend's love interest because I think it's really easy uh, with men to look a little bit more generic and they all have unique facial hair. They all have different color schemes. Everybody, even if they're just a person who's maybe only gonna be around for a couple panels has like a really strong design point of view. And I think that's one of the things that makes the book so fun to read. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, I remember having that conversation with uh, Tom at the beginning where you said you can just use uh, like sort of the same guy with every issue because since we're jumping from one comic to another comic like three times per issue, there's a lot of characters to design. So yeah, that was a lot of extra work. And so we figured why not maybe use the same guy, sort of, like the proto dude. Um, mm -hmm. But then I realized, no, if, if we want this to be interesting, like visually, first of all, a variety is always better. There's also the fact that we want to clearly um, um, really see that we're jumping to a different story. So this cannot be the same dude, especially where she confuses, you know, she, she, she kind of uh, messes with the name. Is this George? Is this, you know, a uh, yes. kid? Is this, if they were kind of lookalikes, I don't think it would have landed as as uh, as well as it does, but thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and Tom, I want to ask you a question about the language in the dialogue because everybody speaks in very period appropriate ways until we put modern swear words in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when did it's... you make the decision that we were going to let contemporary language break in? Oh, it's so much fun to write. I can't. It, it's it's fun. it's a joy to write like really creepy stuff in sort of this really bad prose where I can use like these little flowery <laughs> words and then kind of under, I, yeah, no, that's, that, that's, I, I hate captions in comics. It's one of the things kind of like the thing I don't like in comics. I think that they become so generic. It's all like, um, it, it's just, it's a way for, I feel like sometimes it's a crutch writers use rather than doing like putting cool images or cool stories. They're just like, oh, I'm gonna do cool captions. And I just never, never think that works. Like for a caption to have to work, it has to have a voice. And mm -hmm. so I stole this vo this sort of generic um, 60s, 70s voice from these comics. I was like, oh, and then once you have a voice, you can start undermining, you know, it's like like we did in Vision where we had this weird sort of omniscient narrator. And we could start sort of undermining it by, her, by revealing that she's not quite omniscient. Um, you could do that, yeah. And I, it wasn't fact until the lettering phases that I realized that she'd be the only one who could say fuck and everyone else had us talking growlixes. And she, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, the, what they call those like beepy things, you know, uh, uh, which was a ton of fun because uh, I write a lot of uh, DC comics and I never get to write swear words. And oh, I, I, I wasn't supposed to swear on this thing. Well, she says bleep stuff. Um, so, and so, so it's, it's <laughs> it, 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 was, uh, it was a way to distinguish her from who everyone thought she was, because she's not mm -hmm. someone anyone. She's supposed to be this, you know, and I, and I and the, the the ideal romance um, human being is not someone who ever says a swear word. So it's immediately sort of her breaking free and being like, "I'm not going to be who you want me to be." 
Mm-hmm. Right. Nobody in a relationship ever swears or ever fights. Definitely. Yeah. Or ever fights. Yeah. Or ever takes a shotgun and shoots the guy in the face. That's like never. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> That's later. That's later. <laughs> I got that issue. Uh, I do want to ask about Joan specifically and maybe her philosophies on love. Does anything from your from the creative team's personal beliefs ever bleed through as Joan's going on this journey of self-discovery? I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not shy about this. Like my, I, I happen to be um, uh, incredibly in love with my wife um, and have been for 22 years now. And that leaks through to all my comics. I think people probably get tired of all my superheroes falling in love and having to sort of deal with, <laughs> deal with that. But like, that's just, that's my reality. And so I constantly put that in there. Um, so on some level, Joan is almost the opposite of that because she's someone who's kind of tired of falling in love and someone who's kind of fighting against that. So um, in, in some meta way, this is an examination of myself and my own sort of tendencies to write romance in my comics. And Elsa, do you go around shooting in your bows? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm, I'm kind of on the same level as, as Tom, you know, I've been in a little relationship and very much love for a long, long time. So um, I think we're going to sync up in that, in that regard. And, you know, it's my job is to tell Tom's story. No, so this is where, no, no. And I tell it in, you know, my way. So I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not saying that you're the sole, um, sort of writing creator of the duo. Damn it, but, I almost got it. But, <laughs> so close. <laughs> uh, but though I don't uh, stray away from what you want to say. So whatever you write is what I will draw as faithfully as possible. Because I, I will say on a very shallow level, I do think Joan looks like you. And I think that's very interesting. <laughs> Oh my yeah. God, I uh, know that is the worst thing. Like artists drawing themselves in comic. I always find that <laughs> terrible. Oh, well, I meant that as a compliment. So. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, I hope it's not some like um, narcissistic way of putting myself in my comic. Uh, I think it's just like in a cartoony style. Mm -hmm. I have sort of a cartoony face anyway. I have a small face, I have big eyes. So it's, it's, it's like quick to see the resemblance between the two, but I'm not trying to draw myself, I swear. Mm. Um, <laughs> but when you draw cartoony, you, you have less lines. So the characters mm. end, end up simplified. So it may look like, look like that, but it's not intentional. <laughs> and I hope, I hope it's not subconscious either. I think it just means you'll have somebody to cosplay in the future if that's what you decide to do. <laughs> right. <laughs> You'll have Our... to do that, that center part. That, that, that right, picture. yeah. Right, and then uh, the glasses as well. <laughs> <laughs> Are you both comfortable saying which of Joan's love interest is your favorite or was maybe your favorite to work on? Oh, I have my pick, but it com he comes at, in a later issue, so I cannot say. Okay, so when we're when the whole series has been printed, I'll ask you that again. Right, right. but he's <laughs> my favorite by, by far. Okay, Tom? Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a, oh God, we, we, we rotate through them, but in the first issue, the second story is this guy named Kit, who's such a pathetic loser. I love him. Um, he's like, he's like a Bob Dylan stand in, which was a v very in vogue in romance comics in the seventies to like have girls, to have women fall in love with Bob Dylan and, and then to, re to reveal that he's actually super rich. And, and so he's okay to fall in love with. And I, I, I love that we got to write that just very, very silly story. My, my kids thought that was the silliest thing and they laughed so hard when I told them that story. The idea to like because that would be what that would that's such a typical thing that romance comics do where they would they would create this sort of danger where it seems like there's a rebellion but it's actually the rebellion leads right back to conformity and so that's what kit represents he looks like a rebellion but he's actually conformity so he was very fun to write and it was very fun to write little bob dylan lyrics while he was singing that's good but isn't that the reality of of all teenage <laughs> uh i don't know uh, out out Outlashes, uh, romances, you know, you think it's really edgy and then you turn 25 and you're like, oh, okay, I see everybody else is also doing that as well. Yes, that is, that, no, yeah, no, that, 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 but, oh, but, yeah, that's the trick of the book is like, there's actually some truth to it. Like, the, the, that's the problem with cliches is that they actually have power, you know? So like when you examine them, you're not examining them as just like things to throw away. That's like, I, when I, when I, 
I mean, well, that's why Lichtenstein has power as much as he stole from comic book readers and, and deserves to be driven under the bus. Like when you look at a Lichtenstein on one level, you're like, oh, it's ironic. That's so stupid. And then on the other hand, you're like, that's a really beautiful image of like two people kissing that really affects me. So you're like, it's it's that contrast that brings the power to Lichtenstein. And hopefully we kind of bring that to our comic. Wait, so are we pro, more pro Lichtenstein or more pro Warhol? That's the next question I have to ask. <laughs> no, we're anti Lichtenstein. He stole from my college. <laughs> He's an awful okay. person. Uh, we're wrapping up. So I had just have two more questions left for you both. The first, I know it can be a little nebulous, but are there any Easter eggs or are there specific moments or things that you want readers to look out for who are coming to Love Everlasting purely in its print form? What should they be looking out for? Oh, wow. I mean, it's I the beginning it's of an <laughs> utterly huge story. So... I mean, there are, like I said, I know the ending. I know what's coming on issue 75 if we, <laughs> or issue 30 or, or however we end this. So from you issue- You're your exclusive Tom King yeah. 75 issue run. Yeah, right, we're gonna do it. If you buy it, we'll- I'll, Wait. I'll, I'll, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so from issue one, there are hints dropped at what, at what the ending is gonna be. Um, and if, if you look closely enough, you'll see, you'll see them reflected 75 issues later. For sure. I don't know the, the <laughs> ending myself. I don't know it. Ooh. Um, yeah. In terms of, I don't know if that qualifies as, you know, Easter eggs or stuff like that. But, you know, when you start reading a series, you sort of, you get the gist of the storytelling and the way that we tell the story. Storytelling, I guess. Um, but the cool thing with Love Everlasting is that since we are, and Joan is in many different different comics, you start off a certain way with the storytelling in Love Everlasting issue one. By the time you reach issue two, three, four, five, the story storytelling is entirely different from it, one issue to the next. So hopefully, and that's my goal, where goal number one is to have fun for me. Mm -hmm. Goal number two is to entertain the readers as they go through the issues. There is that element of surprise that I think, that I hope um, will lend. I mean, this is a very weird comic. This is—it's it's hard to find a comp, <laughs> a, a comp to it. It's—it's it's not saga. It's—it's—it's—it's—it's it's, 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 it's more Sandman than anything else. But uh, mm -hmm. what you get in issue one is the idea that like you think this is about romance comics, and it's really not. It's—it's—it's it's, it's a horror. It's a fantasy. It's—it's it's the creation of a new fantastic world you've never seen um, that doesn't look like every other fantasy or post-apocalyptic world, but is is just as um, a built and as fascinating as them. So you're, you're seeing the creation of a new world that's not D&D, but something different. Right, and when you start off reading the book and you think for the first like 10, 15 page, oh, this is a romance comic. No, it's not. Finish issue one and you'll understand that it's really not. Not that there's anything <laughs> yeah. wrong with that, but that's not what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then last but not least, the golden key question. For anybody watching who wants to create their own comics, what advice do you have for them? Start small. Yeah. What a good suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, I have two good, uh, I, have, I like practical pieces of advice. So I'll, these are practical things. Uh, Alan Moore wrote a book on how to write comics. Uh, or, uh, it's, it's a, uh, it was in the 80s, it's on Amazon. Alan Moore is a, is a pretty good writer and he wrote a really good book on it. So if you just want to know how to write comics, just buy that. Like there's literal secrets in it. That's what I did. Um, it's a very practical thing. Go on Amazon. It's five dollars. Buy that. Um, and if, if, if you're a writer or an artist, uh, I've been saying this, but, but give yourself rewards. It helps you write. There's something you're denying yourself. Maybe you're uh, um, on a diet and you're not having a cookie or maybe you want a bike. Um, a, a, a Pokemon card, just there's something you want to do that you've been denying yourself. When you complete something, give that to yourself. Give yourself a little reward and that'll make you want to write more. Have you been denying yourself Pokemon cards, Tom? Should we be concerned? I, <laughs> my, son, my son is Pokemon addicted and he's very Pokemon, <laughs> my youngest. And so um, he, he gets like, when he does his chores and stuff, he gets Pokemon cards. So we, and that, that's why it's on my head. Well, thank you both for joining me today. Thank you for braving the time zones to talk to me. Let everybody know where they can support you on the internet, how to best support Love Everlasting, and then I will send you on your way. Um, the best way to support Love Everlasting is to uh, buy issue one. We have a like a 
incredible lineup of variant and incentive cover artists. And FOC is today, July 18. So make sure to pre-order whichever co cover that you want. And issue one comes out on August 10. And I'm on Twitter, YouTube, and that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, literally, like, uh, I feel sometimes you feel very helpless in comics. Like, your favorite series gets canceled um, or or a character does something you don't want. And you feel like you just, I don't know, you, like you have no power in comics. I, I felt that way myself um, from the time I was little. This is a time you have a lot of power because just by calling your comic book store and saying, I want this comic, put it on my pull list, that's like the equivalent of, you know, 2000 people. Like, like it's, 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 it's such a big deal. You have so much power by doing that in, in terms of um, making us create more and better comics for you. So that's the best thing you can do is just call your shop and say, or when you're at the register, be like, Hey, I'm interested in love everlasting. Just that's all. That's just that one sentence is huge to us. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm on all the things you probably find me on, but I'm Tom King TK usually. Yay! Thank you so much, and congratulations on Love Everlasting. It is a blast. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>